Holy Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to gather around your word. We just ask, Lord, that you help us to concentrate, let the world fade away, and let us only hear your voice, Lord. We want to grow in knowledge of you because the more we know you, the more we'll love you, the more we'll grow spiritually, and the more we'll be able to be fruitful servants in your kingdom. So we ask, Lord, for your blessing on all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, let's go back to Deuteronomy, please. And uh, first of all, before we launch into any fresh exposition, if anybody has something they want to share or a question at this point. I have a question, Steve. Yes, Kevin? Okay. Since we're talking about judgment, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're in a discussion uh, morally and talking as usually to an unsaved friend or a person, mm -hmm. and you make a uh, judgmental statement, a, a discernment, and they like to quote that famous verse, is it Matthew? Yeah, seven. Right, right away they say, yeah. well, judge not. Mm -hmm. So how as a Christian is the best way to respond to something like that? Because okay. most Christians just stay quiet. Right? Yes. Well, you have to take it in context, of course, and that even in Matthew 7, if you read on in the passage, the Lord makes several judgments about there being a broad way and a narrow way. So lifting a verse is a good opportunity to point out to, if it's a lost person, a lost person, or a believer even, that the principle of interpreting the Bible isn't lifting out a verse out of context and making it say what I want, to, want it to say. Because there are times when we are commanded to judge. Uh, for instance, uh, we've been talking about 1 Corinthians, church discipline, and it says in 1 Corinthians 6 that God will judge the world, but we've got to judge within the church. I'm paraphrasing, but this is the implication of chapter 6. Or in chapter 5, with the person that's living in sexual immorality, that they hadn't put out of the church, he says, you know, that a little leaven leavens all a whole lump. You've got to put this wicked one out from among you so that uh, they may be delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And so there are a number of places we can think about 1 Corinthians 11 as well, which tells us to judge ourselves. So there has to be that self-examination in regards to the Lord's Supper. Is Jesus really my Lord? Am I participating in that new covenant in the way that he's my God and I'm his people, that he's writing on my mind and heart as law, and so forth, which the Corinthians weren't doing, they were treating it like their supper and they were carousing. So there are lots of instances in the New Testament where God tells us to judge, and I would just point that out, that even in the same passage, Jesus is telling us to offer many judgments on things, to judge religious hypocrisy and say, we don't want to be like that, to judge the false way that leads to destruction versus the narrow way that leads to life and so forth. So for them to lift it out of context, you know, it's a bit like going to the Uniform Code of Justice or something, or the, the laws of the United States and picking out one law and saying, well, I don't break that one, so I'm an, up, up, an upstanding citizen. Right. No, you're ignoring the rest of what the law says. So okay. maybe there's other insight, though, as to how they handle that. Well, just make sure you don't have a two by four in your eye before you start. Oh, that. exactly so. right. That's right. That's right. So often, and that's what the Lord Jesus said there. And so often, that's um, what we try to do. Don't we try to put others right, not seeing the glaring problems in our own life. But if it's evident that we're doing this out of love, that we really want for the person's betterment, and we are working on. You know, we're walking with the Lord, letting him work on us at the same time. I think that speaks more powerfully, right? But of course, if we come across censorious and just judgmental, that can be a turn off, no doubt. Yeah, you know, thank you for that, uh, not a corrective, but that balanced position, Brother Brian. That's good. Yes, sir. Right. right. Oh. Oh, Brian. Hello. Sorry. Yeah. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, he uh, tells us to watch the why do you judge your brother, a mm -hmm. brother being a brother in Christ. Yeah. Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we all should stand for the judgment seat of Christ. I just uh, noticed that verse when I was just standing here. 
Yes, amen. That's a good principle that uh, Romans 14 is talking about things that weren't outright commandments of the Lord. These were convictions that different brothers had on whether they ate certain things or didn't eat certain things, which would be a big deal to a person getting saved out of a Jewish background, for example. And so they were to receive one another and not to hammer one another based on their own convictions, but uh, to receive one another and to uh, treat one another properly. So thank you for that. That's an excellent cross-reference. Am I missing anybody? Now I'm paranoid that I'm not looking in the right part of the room. Okay, good. All right, we come back to Deuteronomy, and already I have that sinking feeling that I'm not going to cover everything I need to in Deuteronomy this week. So uh, as much as I'd like to camp out on certain things, we have to step lively if we're going to get an overview of the book and some insight into what it's saying. But we mentioned Kadesh Barnea, and I said that in history, that was a loaded name, that it would conjure up a big story for Israel. And the background is in Numbers 13 and 14, which we don't have time to go into, other than to say that you remember, as Deuteronomy 1 indicated, that after this 11-day journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, they're basically on the border, they're, they're ready to come into the land at Kadesh Barnea. And there, depending whether you're reading in Numbers or Deuteronomy, in Numbers, uh, it looks like Moses picks spies to go into the land. In Deuteronomy, you find out that the people suggested that Moses sent spies into the land. And it's one of those cases where there's no contradiction. They're both true. The people basically say, is this going to be something that you know, we really want to undertake sight unseen? Uh, shouldn't we reconnoiter a bit and find out the lay of the land and what it's like? And Moses thought that was a good idea and said, yes, we'll pick 12 spies, and you remember the Bible says every spy was a prince. So these weren't the riffraff, these were leaders among your people. These were supposedly capable men. But every Sunday school child knows, right? 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. And so, uh, how was that? You don't know that song apparently anyway. It's like, we sing in our Sunday school at least. I'll get my kids to do a rendition for you later on. But anyway, uh, they, there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who believed the Lord. And it's interesting, the ten spies, when they came back, they said, truly, the land is exactly as advertised. It's a good land that flows with milk and honey. So they acknowledge God hasn't been, you know, padding the facts. He hasn't been exaggerating how good the land is. It really is a good land, but, now you know that's always a problem. When you say God says this, but, it's probably not gonna end well, right? They said, but, there are also giants in the land, those stinking tall people, and uh, you know, the, the giant, that's a joke, I'm sure. Anyway, <laughs> and the giants, that to them, we look like grasshoppers, which always makes me laugh, because. I envision the spies, and I say, now, what were these guys doing? Did they say, psst, psst, hey, big guy, over here, what would you say I look like to you? Would you say a marmot, a squirrel, a groundhog? Oh, I see a, a grasshopper. Okay, thanks. I'll put that down in my notes. Now, obviously not. If you're a spy, you're ducking and hiding, and you're you know, kind of trying to check out the land. And they looked at these tall guys and they say, we're like grasshoppers in their sight and such were we in our own sight. Now that's more closer to the truth, isn't it? They looked at these big guys and all they saw was obstacles. All they saw what they couldn't do. And Caleb and Joshua had the exact opposite response because they didn't look chiefly at the obstacles, they looked at God. And they said, our God is well able to deliver the land to us. And then the 10 spies said, no, but it's a land that devours its inheritance. Now do you see where lack of faith can go? Lack of faith leads to fear. What does fear lead to? Fear leads to irrationality. A couple moments ago, they were saying, it's a good land. 
It's exactly what God said. And now they're saying, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. Well, which is it? Is it the promised land, this beautiful land of Mokanani, or is it a land that's so dangerous, you're gonna get killed in the land? Is that the question? So they, of course, turned the hearts of the people against the Lord, and they, they put on a brave face, of course. They weren't gonna say, we're cowardly, and we don't wanna go up and fight these giants. They said, well, really, it's for our children, you know? We can't subject our children to this. Now, that sounds good, but the implication is, God, we know better how to take care of our children than you do. And of course, that's a fallacy, isn't it? That the Lord knows better for our children than even we ourselves. And I can tell you, I've seen people through the years, and my children are young, so I speak guardedly because there's no such thing as a perfect parent. Even a redeemed person isn't a perfect parent, and I'm certainly not a perfect father. My wife, as good as she is, isn't a perfect mother, and we make mistakes constantly, okay? Many of them we know about, others we're ignorant of. But nonetheless, I have seen parents through the years make decisions in the name of their children, and you say to yourself, that's a bad decision. Why is it a bad decision? Because it goes counter to what God's word says. Now, one of the great ways, one of the examples that's chief in my mind at least, is we've had so many people through the years leave our assembly in the name of their children. And if they had stayed, we would have had a massive children's work. You know, and it's kind of ironic. And again, there's no perfect local church, so you'll come and find we have our problems too. But it's amazing how people who say, well, I've got to do this for my kids, or they've got to be involved in the soccer league on Sunday, or they've got to be doing this, you know, for their studies or whatever, and they take their kids away from the meeting of the saints, and they show their kids that church is just one of many boxes in our lives, one of many things we do. It's not the chief thing. And God says it's the chief thing he's doing on planet Earth right now. He's building his church. And this is how we work together as the people of God. And this is how God works upon us with the gifts working. And yes, we have our jobs that we do, hopefully for the glory of God, and we have our hobbies and we have our families and so forth. But it all has to come back to the focus of what God's doing in the church. It's meant for our health. And when we make that excuse, so it's for our children, and we don't do what God wants us to do, that's a bad thing. Well, Israel found it was a bad thing too, because even here in Deuteronomy, Moses is going to reference it and say that you said, because of your children, that you didn't want to go in. And uh, yet God said, that's the very people that I'm going to give the land to. Now we look, we'll just break in here at Deuteronomy 1 and verse 29. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now, if I said to you, I'm going to be your bodyguard. Don't worry. You've got to go to a bad neighborhood next week. I don't know what that current bad neighborhood is where you live or what city you live in necessarily, but, you know, every town or area has a bad neighborhood. And I say, don't worry, I'm going to be your bodyguard. You might look at me and you might say, well, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, Keith. I mean, after all, what kind of background do you have in it? And I say, well, I have dark sunglasses. And on TV, those Secret Service guys, they always have dark sunglasses. And I've even got the little earpiece thing that I could put in my ear. You know, they always have that little wire coming up with a little earbud in their ear. You say, well, do you have any references? Now, if a guy came in and said, listen, don't hire Kaiser, hire me. Well, why should I hire you to be bodyguard? Well, you know, when I got out of high school, I went into the Navy and I tried out for the SEALs. And don't you know what? I made it through Hell Week and I made it through BUDS and I became a Navy SEAL. I got the Trident and I served in Afghanistan and I served in Iraq. And after I was finished in the SEALs, I went to work for the State Department protecting diplomats around the world. And then I came back and I worked for the Secret Service for a while protecting the president. Now, would such a person like that be suitable to be your bodyguard? You'd say, sure. Why? Because look at his background in the Navy, look at his background in Afghanistan, look at his background in the Secret Service, whatever it is, right? Here God is saying to them, I'm going to fight for you. 
Well, do we know that that's good? Do we know God can really pull it off? Oh, yeah, amen. <laughs> now, I mean, from a theological point of view, we know it in our head, right? God made everything. God's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. So naturally, God can do it. But think about what he had done in their own lives. One of the hymns we like is how good we is the God we adore. And there's a line in that hymn that says, we'll praise thee for all that is past and trust thee for all that's to come. And that's a very sound principle, isn't it? Going back and looking at what has God done for me in the past. To Israel, he says, all that God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now think about it. Egypt was the superpower of their day. There was no bigger, better, tougher country in the world than Egypt. It was one of the great civilizations, not only of antiquity, but in world history. Go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in New York and look at their Egyptology collection. Go to the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology. Look how much of it is treasures from Egypt. Go to Chicago to the Fields Museum. Go to the Art Museum, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Go to the Louvre. Go to the museum in Berlin. Go to the British Museum in London. And on and on and on. They all have these massive Egyptology collections because for thousands of years Egypt was a mighty scientifically advanced literary place you know the top dog in every kind of area that you can think of and Moses was used of God to bring ten plagues that Exodus 12 says were judgments on the gods of Egypt so the things Egypt worshipped as gods God said, I'm going to show you those things are vanities. They're empty. They have nothing. They're nothing compared to me, the true and living God, certainly. So they worship the Nile River because life came from the Nile in Egypt. God turns the Nile into blood, right? They worship frogs. God gives them frogs till they're coming out their ears, almost literally. <laughs> they worship a locust. God will give them the locust, you know, and, and on and on and on. God brings that superpower to its knees. And the final crescendo of judgment is when God wipes out their army in the Red Sea. Now, with respect, these nations that were giants, they were small potatoes compared to Egypt. In other words, these were nations that wouldn't have stood up to Egypt. We know there was a road going through Canaan called the King's Highway, and even before the time of Moses, there were armies that came up from Egypt and conquered the peoples that lived in Canaan. And they subjugated them and they took tribute from them. So these nations weren't as tough. Now, who's the number one team in the NBA right now? I haven't been following the news. Is it the Lakers right now? The Lakers are pretty good, right? They've got LeBron now. Is that true? Yeah. Anyway, so let's say the Lakers. Now, if you could beat the Lakers, and I say, oh, no. You've beaten the Lakers, but my, you haven't played the Messiah College Falcons. <laughs> you say, who are the Messiah College Falcons? Well, that's my alma mater, and they're a Division three school, okay? When I was there, we had about 2,200 students. There might be a couple hundred more now, but it's a small school. And may I say, even among D3 schools, we've never been a powerhouse in basketball. Now, men's and women's soccer, different thing. We've been national champs many, many times. So, you know, good soccer school, not a good basketball school usually. But it doesn't matter. I could take the champion D3 school, whoever that may be, and I could say, well, look, you got to play them next. And you say, well, pff, who cares? <laughs> if I could play LeBron's team and beat them, it's nothing to beat a college team and a D3 team, please, Division three, small school team. No way. It's no challenge, right? And that's how they should have been looking at it. With God, we can take down any enemy. Look at what God has done for us in the past. Now, we can kind of shake our heads at their unbelief. But it is the natural human tendency, isn't it, to walk by sight and not by faith. To go by what you see around you. You see the obstacle in front of you, and you think, oh, that's a huge obstacle. You see a giant. And you say, man, that's a giant. I can't handle a giant. And you forget the fact 
of what God has done for you in your life, or at least I have. You think about salvation. Is there anything bigger in life that can happen to us than us having eternal life? Than us being brought from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive before God? Is there any obstacle to us that's larger than the sin that separated us from our God? And if the Lord can take care of that issue, can he take care of every other issue in my life? Absolutely he can. You know, what's a, a bill to God? And I realize it's easy to sit here and preach about it when it's not my bill, <laughs> when it's not my debt, when it's not the thing looming over my head. But is this bigger than God? No, it's not bigger than God. And God has already shown me in my history that he can do the biggest thing, the most necessary thing to save me. And he had already redeemed this people out of Egypt and brought them to that point. He carried them through the wilderness. Look at verse 31. In the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you. Please notice this, in that, this simile. As a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Now it wasn't just that God rescued them. And somehow he brought them across the wilderness to that moment on the banks of the Jordan on the plains of Moab. I mean, there are people called coyotes who they will bring you for money across the U.S. border, often down in Mexico, right? On the border between the U.S. and Mexico, you pay these people a certain amount of money, they'll bring you across. But there have been sad stories, and it's not just here, but in Europe, they could tell you sad stories as well about migrants and refugees or different people traveling from the Middle East or traveling from Africa and somebody leaves them locked in a trailer truck and they die of the heat, right? And every year there are people found out in the deserts that have died of exposure or died because they didn't have enough water or died because uh, they succumbed to other things out there in nature. And the person that was bringing them didn't care how he brought them even if it imperiled their safety, he'd leave them to die if, if push came to shove. But that's not how the Lord is. The Lord brought them across the wilderness, and how did the Lord bring them through the wilderness? The Lord brought them as a man carries his son. Now, if I'm in a burning building and the firefighter comes in, I really don't care too much how he carries me out, as long as he gets me out away from the flames, you know? He can grab me by my head, and throw me over his shoulder, or whatever he wants to do, and I say, well, that's what has to happen, and it's the lesser of evils. It's better than becoming extra tasty crispy. But when I want to carry my son from, he's not feeling well, and I want to carry him from his bedroom out to the sofa, especially when he was little and more fragile, I had a prayer, Lord, don't let me drop any of my children. I don't want to hurt them. Balance isn't my strong suit. I fall down by myself without any good reason to, you know? I've been naturally a friend of gravity all my life. I'm always succumbing to it. So when I pick up that little child, I was careful and I was prayerful. I want to be gentle with this child and bring it across. And that's how God was bringing them. Now you read Numbers and you say, well, listen, it doesn't sound so gentle to me. I mean, didn't God send fiery serpents among them be times? And didn't God open up the ground and swallow the, the Korah and those who pertain to him and, and so forth and so on? But you read the context. And those are moments where God has to come out in judgment. And often it's not against the believers among them. There's a mixed multitude. And it's against the unbelievers that don't believe in the Lord whatsoever. And the Lord is coming out against them. But for Israel, he's going to tell us later in Deuteronomy that all that time in the wilderness, your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes didn't get old and tear. You had food. You didn't even know what the food was, in fact. You know what manna means in Hebrew? It means what is it? Now, I've been in countries and even in restaurants where I had that impression. I had no idea what was on my plate. And in some places, you don't want to ask questions, you know. I'll eat it and I'll pray. That's what I do, right? But they, the ir irony is they don't have grocery stores. They don't have restaurants. They don't have uh, one of these services where you can order meals and somebody delivers it to your house. 
They had the word of the Lord. And the Lord fed them, and the Lord took care of them, and the Lord brought them through the wilderness. That's why when they get to the border, and they look at the giants, and they say, no way, we'll be destroyed, and our children will be destroyed. Think of what an affront that is to God. It's like your child coming home from college, and they say, you say, well, I made supper for you. And they say to you, oh, well, I already ate, because I really didn't have the assurance that you'd care whether I ate or not, or that you'd make me supper. And I was afraid if you made me supper that you might charge me for it. And I'm kind of low on cash, you know? And I really didn't think, in fact, that you'd have any food in the house and that you'd make me supper. How would you feel about that? Well, I tell you, in my household, my wife would be like, you know what? I took care of you. I wiped your nose. I changed your diaper. I kept you fed all the days of your life. And when you got bigger and older and started to eat immense portions of food, and then you became a teenager, and we were very much afraid by how much you ate, I still had supper ready for you, and I made you your favorite foods, and I did all this for you, and now you come home and act like I don't care, or that I can't do it, or that somehow I'm going to demand from you. We'd say, what an ungrateful child. What a skewed view of their relationship with their parents, right? And I realized some family relationships aren't good. So there may be situations where it hasn't been a good relationship, but let's assume they're good parents, that they've done the right thing. That'd be a terrible offense, wouldn't it? And here the Lord, after four decades of not only delivering them out of Egypt, he didn't deliver them out of Egypt and say, okay, the promised land's that way. I'll meet you guys over there. He carried them. And when he saves us, he doesn't say to us, now look, guys, someday I'll come and receive you to myself. Someday I'll descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and I'll catch you up to heaven. In the meantime, you've got to do it on your own. Is that what the Lord does? No. It says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I am with you unto the end of the age. That picture of the unnamed servant in Genesis 24, leading Rebekah, back to Isaac, leading her to her bridegroom, whom she's never seen in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit is doing that for us right now. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. And he's bringing us into the knowledge of who Christ is and what he's done for us and how rich he is. Just like the servant showed Rebecca the bracelets and the, even the nose ring. She was, and Laban was very impressed with the nose ring. But anyway, I mean, you're showing the treasures and saying that my my master has given his son all that he had. And the Lord Jesus in John 16 says, all that the Father has is mine. And he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the comforter to come, he's going to take a mine and show it to you. He's going to teach you these things and bring you in it. That's what our God is like. So imagine the affront, the rebellion, when they said, God, we won't go in. Here, God was always with them. He says in verse 33, yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents and to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. Now, what is that talking about? Well, the tabernacle was pitched right in the middle of their camp. God put his tent right in the middle of their tents. His house was right in the middle of the community. When they got up in the morning, the first thing they looked out and saw was the pillar of cloud over that holy of holies, over that most holy place of the tabernacle, indicating the presence of God, what the Jews would later call the Shekinah. And so this is what they saw every morning and every night when they went to bed. The last thing they saw before they closed the tent, the zipper hadn't been invented yet, but somehow they closed the tent and they looked out and saw the pillar of fire. And they remember, God is in our midst. God is here. God is watching over us even at night. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, verse 34, and was angry and took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land in which I swore to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I'm giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord also was angry with me for your sakes, saying, even you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there and encourage him, for he shall cause 
Israel to inherit. Instead of going in at that moment, verse 39 says, Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Now how sad. You say it could have been that they just went right into the land there, that they would have had, seems like there's about, when you compare Numbers 14 with what Deuteronomy 2 is going to tell us, they probably had close to two years preparing in the wilderness and being there at Sinai and the preparation that Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy only takes a few days it seems, but that preparation all told probably two years, but they were going to have 38 years of wilderness wandering and they could have gone in right then. And as God says, the children that you thought were going to perish, that's the very people, they are the very people I'm going to bring in. So it's this question of not walking by sight, of walking by faith, which 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, we walk by faith and not by sight, that we look to the promises of God, we look to God's word, we look to what God has said he will do, and we trust him to do it. And if we don't, if we're unbelieving like they were, there's consequences, there's discipline. Now in the case of that nation, the discipline accomplished nearly an entire generation. And it's the backdrop, by the way, to Hebrews 3 and 4. So you can study those chapters on your own time. But Hebrews goes back to this incident and says, you know, that's what could happen to you. If you don't go all the way in and rest on the work God has done for you in Christ, you could end up perishing like that generation perished. Because they, when push came to shove, they didn't believe in God. See, it wasn't a question of knowing about God. They weren't atheistic. They weren't agnostic. They knew who God was. They had seen God work in their life. But when it came down to it, they wouldn't entrust themselves fully to God. They didn't believe God could do what he said he would do. And so they had to turn back and wander till that generation essentially had died. Other than Caleb, as we read here, and we find out Joshua is mentioned later, he's distinguished uh, from Caleb here because he's gonna be Moses' successor. It is interesting, by the way, that Moses mentions that he's not gonna go in, and he says, because of you. <laughs> now, Numbers <laughs> puts the blame on Moses that God doesn't give him a pass. And yet there was a sense in which the nation had really worked upon Moses. You know, they hadn't been grateful to Moses. They hadn't treated Moses rightly. And Moses, who was described as the meekest man of all the earth, think of the humility of the man, a man who was raised in the courts of Egypt and educated in all their wisdom, had been to the finest schools, and was a, raised for power, raised for authority, raised for better things. And yet he's out there wandering around in the desert with people that are complaining about every little thing. No wonder we said that he lost it, and yet his error was very great because when it came down to it, he misrepresented the Lord to the people. The Lord is not the sort of shepherd that begrudgingly gives his people water to drink. And Moses said, must we bring water from the rock for you rebels? So he lost sight of the people of God as God saw them. Yes, they were being rebellious. Yes, they had done a lot of wrong. But at the end of the day, they were still the people of God. And no, Moses, it wasn't you bringing water from the rock. You were just the conduit. You were the spigot, if you will. It was God who was going to bring that water. And instead of obeying God implicitly and speaking to the rock, Moses took that rod that was supposed to be the rod that would be the rod and staff to guide and protect Israel, and he smoked that rock. And he gave the impression that God is niggardly, that God is a miser, that God doesn't want to pour out his grace on us, that God doesn't want to give to us. And how that's a lie that the world believes about the true and living God, isn't it? They say, I don't want to give my life to the Lord, because if I give my life to the Lord, my life will be miserable. Well, I find people without the Lord Jesus, generally speaking, are miserable. 
sometimes takes them years to figure that out. But not knowing the Lord is missing your very reason for being. You don't know why you were created. You don't know where you're, you've come from, why you're here, nor where you're going. So, of course, your life isn't going to be good, and you're going to be held captive to sin, and you'll do many things that are harmful to yourself and to other people. And yet they say, I don't want to give my life to God. God will mess it up. When in fact our Lord said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And that's exactly what God was holding out to Israel, right? The abundant life. Life, again, that isn't to be defined in terms of the land itself and how much it flowed with milk and honey or how their crops were, would do or how their herds would increase or even how their families would expand. But the best thing about living in the land, you know what it is? That God was there. That they would have God in their midst. And ultimately, God tells them later in the prophets, by the way, I didn't mention this last night, but another good reason to study Deuteronomy is because when you get to the prophets, especially the major prophets, but the smaller ones, it's true of them as well. You get to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and these guys are referring back to Deuteronomy all the time. They don't put a sign up, hey, I'm referring back to Deuteronomy. <laughs> but you read the prophets and you say, wait a minute, where have I heard language like this before? And you realize it's Deuteronomy. And the prophets are calling the nation back to the God who made these promises to them in Deuteronomy. And God is saying, he tells them pretty frankly at the end of Deuteronomy, that if you do it my way, if you're obedient, I'm going to bless you. But if you're disobedient, I'm going to curse you. And there's going to be uh, tremendous repercussions, even though where you're taken out of the land. And that would eventually happen, wouldn't it, in their history? At one point, in fact, God tells them, since you like idols so much, I'm going to take you away to a land where you have to serve idols and see how you like it. And it's a scary thing when a believer says, I want to go out and try the world, you know? Because the world isn't a good taskmaster. The world doesn't have our best interest at heart. And we're not going to enjoy abundant life out in the world. We may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but it leaves scars. It's not good, right? Whereas if you follow the Lord, it's not that there's no trouble. It's not that there's everything goes well. We live in a fallen world where trial and tribulation are endemic, where there are going to be problems because sin is in the world. And God hasn't yet come to judge and put down all sin. Why? Because he's long-suffering, not, not willing that any should perish, Second Peter 3 says. So, you know, you think of what God's offering. And if we just hear the Lord and obey the Lord, it's so much better for us. Now, interestingly, as he goes through this history, he talks about how they would not listen. And they decide then, well, we're going to go up and fight. And the Lord said to, the, to them, verse 42, through Moses, Tell them, do not go out nor fight, for I am not among you, Let you be lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, and you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord, and presumptuously went up into the mountain. Now, isn't that ironic? When God tells them to go, they say, no, we won't go. We don't want to do what you say. We know what's best for us. We know what's best for our children. We won't go. But then God says, okay, you won't go, and I'll give the land to your children one day, but not until you all are dead. And they say, well, on second thought, we'll go. And God says, don't go. You won't prevail. And they say, no, no, we can do it. And the whole thing is a spirit of independence of God, right? Now, that's the opposite of faith. That's faithlessness. Faith is not just knowing in your head certain things are true, not just being convinced of the reality of certain history, of certain things in history or certain propositions, but faith goes beyond mental assent to actual trust. It's saying, I'm going to obey the Lord because I believe his word. I'm going to do what the Lord says. I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to entrust myself to the Lord. And that's what they didn't do. When they didn't go, they didn't go because they didn't have faith in the Lord. And when they did go, it was just the same. See, there was remorse 
they were sorry for the consequences of their sin, that now they weren't going to get in. But there was not repentance. Repentance is, I see God is right and I'm wrong, and I'm changing my mind. I want to be on God's side. I want to trust in God. They didn't do that. So even though God told them what would happen, they still went up in unbelief, and they suffered the consequences from it. Now he says then, verse 46, so you remained in Kadesh many days according to the days that you spent there. Now it's very interesting that as God talks about their journeys in chapter 2, that he's going to say to them, and we go till 11.30, okay? God is going to say to them, we're going to flow right into the group discussion, unless you need a quick break to go to the bathroom or something, we can stop for that. But in any case, in chapter 2, as he's discussing their journeys, it's very interesting that God tells them not to go into certain places. He says, verse 4, uh, this is chapter 2, verse 4, command the people, saying, you're about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Okay, so these are the people we know as the Edomites. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land, no, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord has been with you, you have lacked nothing. And when we passed beyond our brethren, the descendants of Esau dwell in Seir, away from the road to the plain, away from Elot and Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I've given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. And this is so very interesting. God says to them, now don't mess with these people. Don't attack them. Why? Because I'm not going to give you their land. Why? Because I've given them that specific land. Now remember I said, people have a problem with the fact that God said to Israel, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. People say, oh, those poor Canaanites that they came in and conquered. Poor Canaanites, my foot. As we <laughs> said, God gave them 400 years to repent. And when I say repent, these are people that were given over, we know this from the historical record, we know this from archaeology, these were people that practiced human sacrifice, even their babies. These are people that were given over to every kind of sexual perversion, that had rampant venereal disease, that had all kinds of dysfunctional cultures. You see, a civilization can become so corrupt that God steps in and says, enough. That it doesn't proceed any farther, I'm going to remove it. Just like a surgeon would go in and cut cancerous tissue out of your body. Why? Because he's mean and likes cutting you? No. Because he knows the good tissue, the cells that are healthy, are going to be corrupted, spoiled by the cancer, right? And God let these nations have centuries to turn from their wicked ways, and they just went down with a terminal velocity of wickedness till God intervened and said, I'm going to bring you down. And that's the history of nations. You know, Daniel tells us it, doesn't he? He tells us about how God let Babylon come up, this great civilization. Now, was Babylon a righteous people that knew the Lord? <laughs> they are proverbial for obstinacy, for man's unbelief, for humanism, really. The first time we meet them back in Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, they're all about man, right? Man shaking his fist in God's face, saying, we'll show you how great we are. Look at the great big tower we can build. And Genesis says, the Lord God said, let us go down. God has a sense of humor, you see. <laughs> let us go down and see the tower that they built. You think you're so great? You think you're better than me? You think you can rival God? Rubbish! But that's how Babel is. And you can follow Babylon right through the Bible, all the way to Revelation chapter 18, by the way. And they're all about sin. 
and sorcery and spiritual oppression and physical oppression and economic oppression. You want to talk about injustice. And when Babylon is judged, the world economy is shattered and the merchants stand afar off and they lament, oh, that great Babylon, this is terrible. It's the worst thing that could happen. And in Babylon we're found, and it goes down a list of all the things that would speak to their wealth all the linen and the woods and the precious metals and stones, all the things they traded in and made their money. And by the way, it says souls, which the last time I checked in the Bible means slaves. So this is an empire built on the oppression of human beings. You care about injustice. The way to justice is not a government that exalts man as the ultimate. That government will happen one day in our world. The man of sin will rebel over against it. And it will be the worst hour of humanity. Because the best times for man is not when man's on top calling the shots. The best time for mankind is when God's on top and we submit to him. That's true individually. That's true in our families. That's true in our assemblies. That's how the church is designed to function. And it's true of nations. And God says to Babylon, you're going to progress this far. And on one night, I think it was 539 BC, on one night, God brought Babylon down and succeeded it by the Medo-Persians. And eventually that Persian empire would fall to the Greeks, and eventually the Greeks would give way to the Romans. And God established times for these nations, right? The Lord Jesus spoke about the times of the Gentiles in Luke. I think it's Luke 19. These times when God is appointed for certain nations of the world to dominate the world scene, just like he had given the Edomites and the Moabites their territory. And by the way, other people lived there before. Verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Oh, I see. So Moab had their own little conquest, did they? They went in and took somebody else's land. Yeah, because that somebody else was a people that God decided at this point in time that people's going down. Now, what kind of people were these people? Well, he goes on and he talks about these people, or actually before in verse 10, he speaks about the Emim. The Amim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and tall and numerous as the Anakim. Anakim are giants, he says, verse 11. They were also regarded as giants, like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Amim. So think of this. On the one hand, it's telling us God appoints to the nations their places. God gives them a point in time where they come up, and he points a point in time where they go down. God is also telling us that the people who formerly lived there were giants. Oh, I see. So even for a people like the Moabites, who weren't in a covenant with the living God, who weren't believers, they were able to go in and beat the giants. Imagine that. And Israel couldn't do it. Now, isn't it amazing sometimes when you find people in the world doing the right thing and they don't even know what they're doing <laughs> and sometimes we as believers we don't do the right thing even though the word of god tells us to do it it's kind of ironic isn't it and moses in essence is saying look at what god did with these other nations don't you think he'd do it with you don't you think he'd give you victory over the giants if you believe and yet i'm stuck on this idea of the lord giving the nations their places and their times it may sound to you quite arbitrary and quite unfair. Well, I would say on the philosophical level, uh, what is the alternative? The alternative is that there's no rhyme or reason to it, that it's the survival of the fittest, that the people with the most power in history tend to win. So if you get the biggest bomb or the best army, uh, you're able to go out and conquer and do what you like. Is that preferable? to seeing the truth of the matter that the creator of the world is guiding history and that he's allowing the nations to have their time and their day and their place 
all on purpose, all guiding it to an appointed end. And by the way, those nations aren't getting off scot-free for the wicked things they do. Because in Matthew 25, when our Lord talks about the judgment of the sheep and the goats, what is he talking about? He says it's the judgment of nations. So these nations are going to have to account before the Lord one day for what they've done with the Lord's light that he's given them, and especially in Matthew 25, the light of Israel. Now I just give you a cross-reference to think about from Acts 17, Paul's message on Mars Hill. Acts 17 and verse 26. And it's talking about God as creator, Acts 17, 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. So this idea of racism is nonsense, right? I mean, there is absolutely no distinction of humanity. We all come from Adam. We all go back to Noah as well. And we're all created by God. And that's the main issue. So this demarcating ourselves by tribe and ethnicity and color and hating one another for that, that's an evil thing of humanity. It goes against the Bible, of course. But anyway, we read what he says here, verse 26, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So when we think about the nations and the peoples that live on the earth, God has determined their times and the places where they live. To what purpose? He says, Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord, in that they might grope for him and find him, although he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. What is God saying? Well, one of the things God does in history by moving nations around, by exalting certain nations and by abasing other nations, is that God is trying to reach men for himself. He's trying to bring men to salvation, right? And so God raises up Babylon. And you think about how many battles Babylon fought against other nations, how many soldiers died for Babylon to get its hegemony, to get its power. And yet what happened when Babylon was at the apex of its glory, Nebuchadnezzar, their great king, was called in Daniel 2, that head of gold. And what did God do in Nebuchadnezzar's day? Well, for one thing, God raised up Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known to us maybe as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Babylonian names. And God used those men to be a witness to Babylon and to the nations. And Nebuchadnezzar himself had dealings with God. And if you read passages like Daniel 4, he issued an empire-wide declaration that the true and living God was Daniel's God. Now think about that. God brings Babylon to this great position of power. Does that mean Babylon is a Christian nation? No. Does that mean Babylon was godly in everything they did? No. They had over a thousand recognized deities and probably thousands more uh, on the local level, you know, little tiny shrines. They were an idolatrous nation, a nation that God eventually judged for their evil. But at the same time, God used Babylon to spread his word around the civilized world as it then was. And you can look back through history, and you look back to Christopher Columbus coming to America, and now that's very frowned upon, you know? And people used to complain about the missionaries in the 19th century going to Africa and going to Asia, and they talk about missionary imperialism. Well, indeed, we must be careful because it's very easy to equate one's culture or one's form of government or one's political party with the truth of God. And those things aren't the same, are they? So when we look back and see some cases where missionaries and Christians came and made money and oh yeah, told people about Christ, or came and subjugated other peoples and did things in the government that wasn't good, and oh yeah, claimed to be Christian. No, that's not good. But at the same time, we look at how missionaries came to North America, 
and who preached the gospel to Native Americans. The first book printed in the colonies was the translation of the Bible made by John Eliot in Algonquin. And uh, I think it was Algonquin, one of the Indian languages anyway, up in Massachusetts. And you can find uh, record of this, that this is a great literary milestone. But think of that. <laughs> Among the very first things people wanted to do when they got to this continent was to give people God's word in their own language. And think about how the missionaries have gone around the world and everywhere they've gone, they've improved the lot of the people that they found. Because please, it wasn't like dances with wolves, okay? <laughs> These weren't noble savages that were loving one another and peaceable and everything was great. When people came to North America, guess what the Native Americans were doing? The same thing we Europeans were doing, killing each other. Because they're sinners, they need a savior. Guess what they were doing in Africa? Killing each other. And history, you know, it's not so simple as the black hats and the white hats. You know, when we talk about human history, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet you look at a God who's guiding history, who's raising up nations and raising up empires, and even empires that at the governmental level don't recognize God, God says, that's okay, you English, Go ahead and build your British Empire. The sun will never set on it, they said. And we'll, I'll use the railroads to take my missionaries. I'll use the ships to take my missionaries. I'll use the printing presses you establish to print my word. I'll send people forth, and they'll establish colleges and universities to teach people literacy so they can read the word of God. I'll establish hospitals, not just to deal with people's physical needs, but to preach to them about their spiritual need, their need of Christ. And so it has been in history. Is America a Christian nation? No, absolutely not. But there are a lot of Christians that have been used from America in our country and right around the world to go out and tell others about the Lord Jesus. And God's working in how he raises countries and how he puts down countries and even where he's put countries to spread his word to them. I met a brother not too long ago, a couple of years ago, who ethnically is Iranian, and his wife ethnically is Russian. And I laughed, I said to them, I don't think they were amused, but I said, you know, this is kind of ironic. I said, I grew up as a kid in the 80s, and we were taught that the Soviet Union was the evil empire. And so, Whenever I was playing, if I wasn't hearkening back to war games with World War II or something, I was thinking about the Cold War. I was killing Russians, you know? And then when I was a boy of six, when I was a boy of six, the young students there in Tehran stormed the American embassy and the Iranian government came in and held American hostages for 444 days. And we hated Iran. We'd see them on the news burning the American flag and chanting death to the great Satan, meaning America. And yet here was a brother and a sister, an Iranian and a Russian. And I said, praise the Lord, because these nationalistic distinctions and these political distinctions in the body of Christ, they don't matter, do they? Today, praise be to God, God is saving many people in Iran through the satellite broadcasts that have gone in, through the internet, through literature that's been smuggled in. God's been doing a great work in the Middle East. We don't hear a lot about it because it's done in a context of persecution. But that's how God works. And God used the fall of the Soviet Union to do what? Well, when the Soviet Union first opened up, some of you guys are too young to know about that, but one of the first things that happened was Christians went in with the word of God. And believers that have been persecuted for generations in Russia suddenly could meet openly. And many other people were one for the Lord. I knew a brother who went into St. Petersburg, Russia, and he and another man said that in about 10 minutes, they gave out 7,000 pieces of literature in one of the largest parks in St. Petersburg. And I think it was 10 minutes, and I think it was 7,000. Don't quote me on the numbers exactly. But thousands in a very short amount of time. And he said afterwards, when he went back over the area, he could only found, find three 
gospel booklets that have been thrown away or thrown down on the ground. He said, because at that time, there was such a hunger in Russia for the word of God. And people wanted the Bible or wanted books about the Bible or wanted anything they were taught, uh, that was about the truth. And so they invited people like David Gooding and John Lennox in to lecture in some of their science academies and even to lecture the KGB, think about it, that their intelligence service on ethics from the Bible. And they wrote a weekly column in the teacher's magazine about the gospel. I mean, unprecedented, unheard of. And yet that's what our God can do. He's working in history, brothers. So we look around at the world and we say, oh, it's a mess. Look at this country and look at that country and look at that war and this war. And that's the very thing God might be using to open up people's eyes to the truth of eternity. Not that God condones man's sin. Not that he's on board with the wars and the ravages we do to one another on this planet. But God says, you're not going to stop me. I'm going to raise up peoples. I'm going to put down peoples. And it's all with the goal of reaching out to people, that people might come and know me. Okay. Uh, comments or questions? We're now into the group session time. So... Please feel free. Well, I'd just like to say, uh, to me, one of the greatest offenses that they had uh, when they you know, rejected going into the land is when they said that it was because God hates them. Mm -hmm. Amen. In verse 27. And just the idea of all he had done for them, not only how But he cared for them. Mm -hmm. Just to say that as a reason mm -hmm. uh, just uh, shows you how how quick we can slip away. Mm -hmm. I always think like how the Holy Spirit that's within us. I think like if God, like the Old Testament, perhaps with like King Saul or something. He would, he would just remove that spirit how quickly I would be up to my old tricks. Oh, and mm -hmm. I would be walking in darkness again without mm -hmm. him constantly reminding me of his presence and his goodness and how much he loves me and what he, what he expects of me. Mm -hmm. and he gives me the power to live the life that he's called us to live. Like, we're not doing it on our own strength because if we are, we're failing. That's right. And they, even after God told them, look, now you're not going to go into the land. So that they almost had like the Tower of Babel mentality again. They said, we'll oh, make a name for ourselves then. That's We're right. not our own strength. Watch us. Amen. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Lou. Excellent. Uh, Brother Ryan and then Brother Keith. Um, in Deuteronomy uh, 1. Verse 31, it talks about uh, God carrying the uh, people of Israel mm -hmm. and the father with his son. Yes. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 3, it also talks about the house of Jacob and how the remnant of Israel was carried. It says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. Even here, O H I D, even here, great here, I will carry you. I may, and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. And there's one more in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, which says, In all their affliction, Israel was afflicted, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them, and he carried them all the days of old. So, one of these, a couple of verses I uh, thought about with God carrying the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, that was Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. And Isaiah, did you say 63 was the other one? Isaiah 63, verse 9. 63, verse 9. Yeah, like I said, we see Deuteronomy popping up, and Brother Ryan is really good at cross-references, so 
He's shown us a couple examples. In fact, in Isaiah 46, at the opening of that chapter, he talks about Bel and Nebo, who were Babylonian idols. So it's in the context of Babylon. It's kind of funny, we were just talking about Babylon, but this is exactly, says Isaiah, what God was talking about back in Deuteronomy. So thank you. We see these reoccurring terms. The more we get to know Deuteronomy, the more it sticks out to us. Very good, brother. Uh, brother Keith, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> I love looking at the examples for us that we see with Israel, uh, Old Testament, as we're looking at, you know, but God sovereignly chose them, uh, just as he sovereignly chose the church, and he desired to make uh, faith and obedience, <clears throat> and yet almost from the day that they left Despite seeing the plagues, lack of faith, lack of obedience, you know, Red Sea, which bring us out here to perish, he parts the Red Sea, like you mentioned, destroyed Egypt, uh, provides food and water for them in the wilderness, they reach for them, and uh, it's just a, such a lesson for us, you know, their lack of faith, their lack of obedience. And in many ways, I believe their disobedience and lack of faith, <coughs> excuse me, culminates at Kadesh Barnea. Yes. Uh, and, um, you know, he, it's seemingly to me, I guess, you know, he tests them, he tests us. Uh, they reach the Red Sea, they don't look to the Lord where they are. Okay, here comes Pharaoh, here's the Red Sea, they cry out again, to bring us out here to kill us, right? Uh, Numbers 13, God said, you know, I just, I was thinking about this, correct me if I'm wrong, another test, send out spies, knowing, of course, the end of the beginning, know that the report of the spies is going to say, oh, we can't go in there. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, in Hebrews we read, without faith it is impossible to mm -hmm. please God. Right. And I always think of this, when we look at Israel, and I just like, oh my gosh, how could they have reacted in such a way? Yeah. And yet I always think about what's brought out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 6, and then repeat it again, these things happened to them as examples, or I like Darby calls them types of us. And then it's, again, as I said, it's repeated, verse 11, these things happened to them as types of us, written for our instruction, written for our admonition, uh, on whom the end of the ages has come, you know? So, uh, and, and Moses certainly is rehashing his disobedience and lack of faith in the portion of Deuteronomy that you've covered so far, and yet it's all a picture of us. How do we respond when we're tested? Do we look to him? Do we rely on him? Do we obey his word? Right? Um, look to Israel as an example. Excellent. Yes, thank you. And uh, Brother Keith's quite right. Uh, as I briefly mentioned, Numbers says that it's God who says, send out the spies. And Deuteronomy, Moses says, you have the idea of the spies. We see it's both, that God knew what they wanted, and they knew that this is what they wanted. So there's the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. We only see those two things together in Scripture. And you're right, it's not God's fault. I mean, that information was information, but it was not mixed with faith, as Hebrews says. They didn't have that faith and obedience, as you mentioned. And we can be, as First Corinthians 10 says, we can be a uh, fall prey to that as well. So we have to be careful. Thank you, Keith. Yes, Brother Rich. Isn't it that God does not test man at all? The mm -hmm. test is that we are taught what we are like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, I'd have to think about that. I mean, there, there's certainly truth there. He does show us what we're like. 
And, and it is true that 1 Corinthians 10 goes on to say that God doesn't uh, tempt, that with any te there's no temptation with such as common to man. God with the temptation provides us the way of escape. We know, of course, James says that he doesn't tempt any man to evil. And yet, there are other places, because the word tempt is the same as the word test in many instances. And you do find in some instances, some scriptures, that the Lord tests us. Like he'll see it say in James 1, God doesn't tempt any man to evil because he can't be tempted by evil. And then later in the same chapter, it's hard to see in English, but it's the same word group. He says, blessed is the man who is a, uh, who, let me get to it again, misquoted here. Sorry, the man who, um, is approved, or some of the modern translations say passes the test, because it's the thought he'll get the crown of life. James, okay, so James, sorry, who said 112? 112, thank you. James 112, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved. And the word approved, is that idea of testing, but the thought is you've passed the test. So the believer passes the test. When he's approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the word has promised to those who love him. If you love the Lord, that's evidence that you pass the test, that you're a believer, in other words. But Brother Rich is right that many times um, God shows us what we are. He, you know, we say something, we profess to be something, and God says, you think you're all that, let me show you what you really are. Maybe the most famous instance is Peter, leading up to the crucifixion, who says, though all may forsake you, I'll never leave you. You know, Lord, I'm not, you may all deny you, brother, I'll never deny you. And yet we know that very night he denies him three times, and the Lord tells him so. And yet the Lord doesn't do that to be cruel, uh, in John, he follows it right after he says that at the end of John 13. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and so forth. So he follows it with Peter. You don't know yourself, you're going to deny me. But that doesn't make the Father's house any less certain for you. Because you getting there isn't dependent on you. It's dependent on me, my work. It's grace, in other words, that saves us, not our works. Now, when he says it in Luke, I think it's chapter 22, he tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times, but he says, but when you are converted, or some translate it, when you are restored, strengthen your brethren. So he, the Lord is always telling the disciples and Peter how they're going to fail. They think they're so strong in themselves, and the Lord says, no, 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 you're going to fail. But listen. There's life after failure. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to pick you up again. And your eternal welfare, your eternal life with me is not in jeopardy by this. So yeah, that's what you are. In that sense, Brother Rich is absolutely correct. God shows us what we are. But in another sense, um, I think it was Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, the Lord looks for proof from our lives. And this is what James 2 is all about. Faith without works is dead. That if we say we believe the Lord, it's going to issue an evidence. There's going to be evidence of life. Uh, just like the analogy has been given, if a baby cries, it's a sign of life. You know, if a baby doesn't cry when it's born, you worry. Is there something obstructing the airway or is it still born? It can be a tragedy, right? But that's probably the only time in your life you're happy to hear the baby cry because you say, this is good. The baby's alive. It's breathing. And the Lord, in that sense, puts us in situations to develop our character and to demonstrate the reality of what we have. So it's both. In some cases, it's never a test intended to make us fail or sin. God doesn't do that, James says. But there is the sense of being tested that we're approved, that we're demonstrated to have that real faith in the Lord and that real life from the Lord. Okay, uh, are you pointing or putting your hand up? Uh, Sorry. I just wanted to get one thing. So, right? Yes, please do. We were in 1 Corinthians 10. Yes. I mentioned, of course, that you mentioned, of course, and you mentioned Peter. Yes. And I think he is certainly the most of 
boy who will for the person who did mention in the twelve. Yeah. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands yeah. take heed. Amen. Default. Amen. That's right. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And that that's pursuant to Brother Rich's observation as well. It's when we think we're doing well, or coming back to what Brother Brian said, when we're doing it in our own strength, that's a recipe for failure. You know, we need to lean hard on the Lord. That's the lesson Jacob had to learn. He had to learn to lean. Yes, sir. If you had get your opinion on something, I remember reading, going back to the rock, mm -hmm. that uh, the first time that it represented the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. That at the first time, uh, Moses was told to strike the rock, in yes. order to come forward, but yet the second time he was told to speak to the rock and not to strike. Yes, where you have the symbolism there that the Lord suffered once. Yes, amen. That's right. Yes, yeah. and not to suffer again. Yes, that's true. I think at the historical grammatical level, Numbers tells us Moses gets disciplined there because he hasn't obeyed the Lord. He didn't do what the Lord told him. But looking at it by way of the bigger story of the Bible. Yeah, like, like, yeah, that's definitely right, that we can see the picture was spoiled in a sense. And David Gooding even pointed out to me um, in an email years ago when I asked him about this, that, that that rod being taken and being used against the rock at that time was giving this impression of God that the way God had used the rod against Egypt in judgment, that this is what was happening there in Numbers 21. And this wasn't a judgment against Israel. The water was going to come from the rock as a mercy. Again, we're in 1 Corinthians 10. They drank of that rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. So it wasn't intended, I mean, there was nothing wrong with the request. They needed water. They were thirsty. True. They were kind of whiny in how they asked, okay? So that's why Moses gets upset. But God doesn't look at the request as illegitimate. He knows his children's need. And when we give the impression that God doesn't want to give his children what they need, we've misrepresented God. Now, many times people think they need things that they don't really need or things that would positively destroy them, and God doesn't give them. That's James 4. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume them on your lusts. So God's very wise in giving us the best things and withholding from us the things that are harmful. But uh, Moses, on all counts, dropped the ball there, as you said, spoiling the type because our Lord would be smitten once and also misrepresenting God at that moment in time as making it look like he wouldn't do what they needed him to do to keep them alive. Good observation, thank you. Other comments or questions? All right. Uh, what would be, would you say, an example of a believer uh, being tested of their faith in your passing or, you know, failing the test? Uh, well, that, <laughs> I'm sure there are thousands of, you know, we, as many as, as many believers as there are, there are multiple examples per believer that in life we have to, um, we are tested in what happens to us. You know, that the Lord often brings a trial into our life because he wants to teach us dependence on himself. And this is why, by the way, going to the deeper question of why God permits suffering in the world and pain, people often say, well, where's God in a coronavirus world? Well, God is doing a lot of things by letting coronavirus come to the world and do what it does. I mean, the world has sin in it, and sin's going to produce certain negative things. But God is able to take the negative thing and actually use it for good, as Romans 8, 28 is going to say. Now, uh, for example, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 would talk about there was given a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh. Now, what was the intention of that? Well, I'll tell you. Satan didn't like Paul, okay? And he doesn't like any believer. He really doesn't like human beings because they're created in the image of God. And he wants to destroy everything to do with God's word. So Satan wanted to put a stake, is how some translate it, in Paul's side. 
to give him something really painful just for the mean-spiritedness of it. But what does Paul say about it in 2 Corinthians 12? Well, he says the Lord actually used this. Because of the abundance of the revelations I was given, I saw things that God has never shown anybody else. And inevitably, I'd be lifted up with pride to where I wouldn't be useful to the Lord. So the Lord allowed Satan to give me something that would be painful to me. And even though I prayed three times for God to take it away, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, I'm not taking it away, but I'll give you grace to bear it. So we can see believers, I've known many believers, who've gone through chronic illness for years and years and years. And God uses it in their life. And we think, you know, if this person was just healthy, how much more they could do for God? And the answer is, no. Maybe if they were just healthy, they wouldn't think about God as much. They wouldn't be as devout in prayer, or they wouldn't have the time to pray for the people of God. They wouldn't be the witness of the goodness of God, even in hard circumstances. Or someone who loses a loved one so often, that's a great opportunity. Uh, Ecclesiastes actually says that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, because there a man will consider his end. And, you know, we think about funerals as just being bad things, but there are a lot of people that have been converted at funerals. There are a lot of people that have met the Savior, or that's been a link in the chain of meeting the Savior, because somebody else died. And sometimes it's tragic circumstances. One of my friends, um, she was converted as a teenager because she was at a Christian youth group event. And one of the, there's always a guy in the youth group who's kind of the guy, you know, he's like the cool Christian, not in a bad sense, but he's the guy everybody wants to be with. He's kind of taking the lead. He's, you know, leading them out and giving out tracks or speaking for the Lord. And he's involved in service and everybody's kind of following that guy's lead. Well, this particular guy was an elder son and he was a great athlete and everybody liked him. And they were at a youth group event, they were riding in a hayride, and somehow he fell out of the wagon and got run over and killed. And it was actually at his funeral that my friend got saved. That as she was there at that funeral listening, as his uncle, I think it was, preached the gospel, that was what the Lord used to bring her to the Lord. So you might look at it on one level and say, oh, Here's this tremendous thing, and it was a test for their family. It was a test for that assembly. It was a test for probably all the young people that knew him. And yet, one thing that we know that God did was he used it immediately to bring someone to the Lord. Now, he used it in other ways, I'm sure, over the course of years, and maybe he's still using it. And you can think about the five martyrs in Ecuador. They got killed in 1956, and yet what they did and how they lived for the Lord up to that point is still impacting people all over the world. So this is how God is, that we don't always know when something comes into our life, we quite naturally ask why, but God wants to develop in us this eternal life that's working in us. He wants this to be a moment where we can grow in the Lord. He also wants it to be a moment where we can glorify the Lord, where others see our testimony. And we may not know all the things that he's doing till we get home to heaven. But that's where we trust him. Yes, Brother Jerry. Mm -hmm. Amen. My thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not yours. Amen. Brother Rich? interesting that same principle you can see so many times in people in the Bible in Saul's case King Saul of the Old Testament that when he started out he had that attitude that he was unimportant what am I what is my tribe what is my father's house 
among the thousands of Israel. You know, basically, I'm not up to the job. And you think, Saul, if you had just kept that, that attitude, how much different things would have been. And even David, who so much had that attitude, not I, but the Lord. It's not coming in the name of David to victory. It's coming in the name of the Lord. But even later when David sins, the Lord says to him, when you were little in your own sight and following after the sheep, that's when I picked you. You know, think about it. You know, apart from me, you can do nothing. You, you are nothing. As Brother Rich as well said, we need the mercy and the grace of God. And it's no, gift is no substitute for that. We can be a very gifted person, but first of all, the gift comes from God, and if we're not using the gift as the Lord directs us to, relying on Him, then it's like a clanging gong, 1 Corinthians 13 says. You know, it's not going to be uh, to our honor anyway, not to say the Lord can't use us in spite of ourselves, but it's not going to be useful. Other comments or questions? Yes, Brother Jerry. Mm. Yes, amen. Romans 11, isn't it? The end of Romans 11 where it says that? Yeah. Uh, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of God, how unsearchable. Um, are his doings and his ways past finding out, I think, something on that. I'm not quite getting it, so I'll read it. And I'm mainly doing that, brother, for the recording's sake, just so you know. Well, sure. So for the recording, Brother Spinelli shared with us that scripture at the end of Romans 11, Romans 11, 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And earlier he had quoted to us, the Lord's ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts our thoughts. And speaking to that example that I mentioned of the five martyrs in Ecuador, if you're not familiar with the story, that's Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, Ed McCauley, Roger Yadarian, and Nate Saint. Most of them had individual biographies written about them, and plus there was at least one collective book about them. They were five young men who went to a very hostile tribe in Ecuador. In those days, they were called the Alca. Today, they're known as the Warani, or some say Wadani. Since I'm not fluent in their language, I have no clue which is right or both, whatever. 
In any case, uh, these young men were speared to death, as Brother Joe mentioned, some of them not yet 30 years old, and all of them young. And this affected Brother Joe, who was in his teens at the time, and all of his friends. This was just something that the Lord used to grip the hearts of a lot of young believers. And he even mentioned that his wife has an old copy of Time magazine. They did a full issue of their magazine about what had happened to these young men. Of course, you know, some of the rest of the story is that the sister of one of the martyrs, Rachel Saint, and the widow of another, um, Elizabeth Elliot, as she was then, they went back to that tribe with the gospel. And over time, a number of people in that tribe got saved. In fact, uh, some years back, I watched the video where they had a 50th anniversary celebration of those missionaries coming and dying. And it was organized by the heads of that tribe who were believers. And they had this, we have a sister from our assembly that was a missionary in Ecuador. She was there for it. They organized and did everything. And they had several people speaking who had been involved in the war party that killed the missionaries. And some of those very people themselves got saved. And at least one of them was later martyred for the faith. Now you add to that, that about 10 years after the event, Moody said that they polled people around the world and they found out 10 years after the martyrdom, there were over a thousand missionaries around the world who were tracing their call to the mission field to that event. That's what God used to get a hold of them, get them interested in missions. And I know two missionaries personally, each served in different countries for over 40 years, one in Ecuador, the other in Brazil, and I independently asked each of them, what was it the Lord used to get you interested in missions? They said the five martyrs. And so that's a story, as Brother Joe reminded us, it's human to ask why. We don't know why always. The Lord doesn't tell us usually. But when we get to heaven, we're going to know. The Lord is going to explain how he's worked out these purposes, and we're going to see more of what he's done. So even the things we can see, give us confidence, but the things we can't see, we take on faith because we know the goodness of our God. Okay, other questions or comments? Brother Anija. Well, this is maybe not a specific question, but uh, how all things work together for good, but mm -hmm. people who didn't have time to, to be uh, conformed to the image of the Son from Amen. Uh, chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. So we have to go on to that second verse. So Absolutely. It's really important. That's right. Yeah. Brother Nijin's reminded us the context of Romans 8 28 that you need to go on to verse 29 to grasp the good, that it's to be conformed to the image of his son. And the Lord is using every tool in his toolbox, so to speak, to accomplish that, to change us into people like his son. It's wonderful. Very good, brother. Thank you for that. Other questions or comments? I have a slight uh, question. Yes. Just, uh, where uh, the Lord mentions in Deuteronomy about uh, the little ones who had no knowledge of good and evil. Right. Is there do you think that could be used in any way to come up with some sort of an age of accountability or anything for, uh, you know? Um, I don't know that it can. And the question is for the recording, can we use the little ones who don't know good and evil as any kind of age of accountability? That's difficult to say because ultimately it was anybody under 20 years old. And 20 was when you were old enough to be a man of war. So obviously teenagers know about good and evil. I don't know if we can really set an age on that. And I think it, uh, this is only anecdotal or personal experience, but I've met believers who say that they've understood sin and righteousness and the gospel from a very young age, like some have told me three or four. And I don't doubt that. Some of us are a little bit slower. So it took us, you know, till later. Um, so that's why I don't think the Bible puts a hard and fast age it's probably more individual, you know, 
that's how God deals with our heart. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's definitely an indicator of God's mercy. And so often in the Bible, he talks about how much he loves children. and What a great crime it is to stumble one of these little ones, he says. So you're right, brother. That's very now, interestingly, if I can just use a little bit of our time here in the thought flow of our passage, that as he talks about taking the land away from certain people and giving it to others, we've seen that there's this wider work of God in working out world history and global events, geopolitical affairs, if you will, for the greater purpose of people coming to know the Lord, obviously, or at least knowing about the Lord if they don't believe on him. And then the other thing, though, is that this still has its direct implication for Israel. It's determining how they were to walk and how to live. And after talking about these different peoples that they weren't to attack, God comes in in chapter 2, verse 26, and tells them somebody that they would attack. I sent messengers, this is 2.26, I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemon to Sion, king of Heshbon, with words of peace saying, let me pass through your land. I will keep strictly to the road. I'll turn neither to the right hand nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink only. Let me pass through on foot, just as the descendants of Esau who dwell in Seir and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. And it's interesting, um, just on the practical level, there's a certain amount of testimony here that we're going to come and we're going to do the right thing. We're going to ask permission. We're going to buy the things that we need. We're going to be upright. But the response is that, verse 30, Sihon, king of Eshbon, would not let us pass through, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, See, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it, that you may inherit his land. Now this is not yet over the Jordan River. This is on the east side of the Jordan. And yet God says, I'm going to give you Sihon, the king of the Amorites, territory. So he tells them to go out and destroy them. And by the way, again, people have problems with this concept of destroying men, women, and children in the Bible. That was not universal in battle for Israel. In fact, Deuteronomy is later going to give very clear instructions on what they're going to do and not do in a battle, who they're going to spare, even which trees they're going to cut down or not cut down. So this is not God just saying, oh yeah, kill them all, okay, like the old t-shirt, kill them all, let God sort them out. No, it's not the God of the Bible, okay? But this is a people that God has decided, I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to destroy you. And people, of course, don't want to grant God that right. But we remember that every person that dies in this world, that that's been appointed by the Lord. Hebrews 9.27 says, and as it is appointed once for a man to die, but after is the judgment. So the days of our lives, do we determine them? Is it how much exercise I do or uh, the right vitamins I take? Listen, there are health nuts that drop dead every day, right? And there are slobs like me who just go on for decades. And that's the mercy of God. And God determines the lifespan of a human being. And God determines that some people are going to be taken as children. Some are going to be taken as teenagers. Some are going to be taken as elderly people. It's all in the providence of God. God has that figured out. And in the end, we're going to see God does it justly. Because just because children were killed here, temporal judgment does not necessarily equate to physical, I mean, sorry, not physical, eternal judgment. In other words, if these children were left to grow up in Sihon's kingdom, they would be growing up in a scene of what I called before terminal depravity, where the evil has become so great that everything is corrupted. And these children would grow up in a situation where if they're not sacrificed, they're growing up in a situation where they're abused 
and being taught to be abusers. So God instead says, no, we're going to cut off these children's physical lives, but that doesn't mean that that meant they didn't gain eternal life. Because we know that when it comes to little children, the Lord Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he spoke about their angels appearing in the presence of God, always beholding their faces. We can think about David talking about his dead child, saying, he will not come again to me, but I to him. And I believe, knowing what we know about the judge of all the earth, who says in Genesis that he will do right, that those who haven't had an opportunity to interact with that light meaningfully, that they've died as young children, or that they've maybe been bereft of the faculties to interact with that. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're under the judgment of God. I wouldn't be surprised if they are in heaven. In fact, that would be my personal belief. So that's number one. Temporal judgment and eternal judgment are two different things. But number two, once again, God's going to do this on a global level one day. This is not just God saying, oh, I'm picking on Sihon or I'm picking on Og or I'm picking on the seven nations of Canaan. The Lord's going to come back and judge the whole world. And people don't want to hear that. But if they're not right with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be consumed. Not only will they physically be killed when the Lord comes on that white horse in Revelation 19, but they will stand before the judgment of God at the great white throne of judgment in Revelation 20 and hear the Lord say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Not because God didn't want to save them, not because they couldn't be saved, but because their names weren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They had never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see God acting as judge, and he's going to use Israel as the instrument of his judgment. Now you might say, well, God, uh, Israel wasn't perfect either. And pursuant to that, we'd say, well, yeah, think about Habakkuk, the so-called minor prophet, or Habakkuk, if you prefer. Old Habi, he said, God, things are getting so bad here in Israel. Why don't you do something about it and judge them? And God said, all right, I'll work a wonder in your days, which you would no wise believe even if it were told you. I'll raise up that bitter and hasty nation, the Babylonians, and I'll bring them against you. And Habakkuk says, wait a minute, God. I didn't mean that. I mean, those guys are worse than us. And God says, yeah, I know it. After they win the battle, they'll turn around and give the glory to themselves and to their false gods, and then I'll judge them. So God, as judge of all the earth, reserves the right to use nations to judge other nations, but in the end, nobody gets away with it. There's got to be the grace of God. If you're going to be saved, it's not because you've been better than somebody else. It's because God has extended salvation as a free gift through Christ. So we're going to see God gives them Sihon's land and Og's land. And just uh, one more comment on that because we're approaching the lunchtime and I know better than to get in the way of your grub. An army marches on its stomach and I can only imagine what a Bible study does. But anyway, this is again the mercy of the Lord to Israel because they're about to go in and fight these seven nations that are truly formidable from a military standpoint. And so what God does is he gives them a taste of victory. He gives them two instances where they beat, you know, pretty impressive characters. Og himself is a giant. If you don't believe him, just check his bed out. Or maybe it was a sarcophagus, the Hebrew scholars debate. But anyway, he was a big guy. And yet God used Israel to just defeat them. As amazing, if you plug their names, it's a good study, and go into the rest of the Bible, how often God points back to Sihon and Og and talks about what he did to them. It's like God keeps saying, remember what I'm capable of. Remember when you trust in me, what can happen. Remember those guys that I took down in your past. Well, I can do this in your present as well. So God is good to teach his people, even by giving them some victories, that they can go on to greater victories, remembering what God can do. Okay, with that, I yield the floor to Brother Ezekiel. All right, so that was an amazing 
fun of learning. So glad that the speakers and the teachers are working. So I was there helping out a little bit and I'm tasting everything before it comes out. I don't know. It's my job. So let us give thanks for the food that we have and uh, we welcome Brother Jonathan. Thank you for arriving here safe. We were informing about you. So let us pray. You got Heavenly Father, we thank you again. Uh, for this amazing uh, time of learning, Father. Thank you for allowing us to just take this time off and be in, uh, on the sound teachings of the word, Father. We thank you. Again, we have the blessings on you that we wish to provide, Father. We thank you for all the dear sisters, older and younger, uh, that participate in making this meal possible. We thank you for the information above all. We thank you for that uh, great salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All this recipe that we thank you for this Christ.